The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship today. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, I am Pastor Spencer. It's good to be here. Uh, this week we will be having VBS, and so during this service we will have a VBS installation part of our service. I am excited. Our theme for scuba under this uh, diving into friendship with God is going to be awesome. Have you seen some of the decorations? If you looked up when you came in, you saw the sharks and the fish. I love that decoration. Super simple, but awesome. I'm looking forward to this week uh, quite a bit. A couple of things that I wanted to mention just as we are coming into the kind of end of the summer is that, again, the Nazareth Summer Lunch Program is coming up. This is something that we as a church volunteer to help out with in our community. If you're able to join in for any or all of that, please see the sign up on the bulletin board. Uh, come and help us feed our neighbors. That is part of the call of the Christian church. There's plenty of other things going on here at Trinity. See the bulletin for the full list of information. And I gave it out last week, but if you uh, didn't hear it, please save the date of October 12th for a church skeet shooting trip. If anybody who's interested in that, let me know. I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I'm going to lose. I'll be the worst one out there, but I'm going to have fun. <laughs> um, but one other thing that we do need to talk about, it's a bit of an elephant in the nation at the moment, is yesterday there was an attempted assassination attempt, as far as we can all tell, um, on uh, presidential candidate Donald Trump. Um, this should not happen in America. We are not a people of political violence. We do not attempt to kill those who we disagree with. This is completely unacceptable, and whatever fomenting hatred is running through the lives of our people and our country, it is antithetical to the call of Christianity. Christians are not people of hatred. We are not people of violence. No matter if you love or you hate a person, we are all called to love and to serve our neighbors and to forgive how many times when Peter asks? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. And in the biblical story, 490, which is the answer to that, is not just a number. It has the meaning of completeness. And so what Jesus says to Peter, his main, one of his main disciples, the one who the church is built on, that you are to forgive endlessly. You are to love endlessly, and you are to feed the sheep of God. That is our call as Christians. And so as our nation is gripped by political nonsense, as hatred runs rampant, we hold to Christ. We hold to peace and we hold to the God of truth, justice, and love. Today in our prayers, we will pray for former President Donald, uh, Donald J. Trump, and we will pray for the individual who was also killed at the, uh, from the stands. I could not find a name this morning, but we will keep their, them and their family in, their prayer, in our prayers, even though we don't know them, as well as the two people who were shot. We will also pray for the person whose life has been ended because they, they did something terrible, not because we approve, but because we pray for all of God's children, no matter what darkness they're in. Sorry for bringing us down on this very serious topic, but it is important for us to talk about these things as Christians. Today's gospel text will also, strangely, be about political violence. It's the story of John being beheaded by Herod. So there's no escaping it today. The world is full of terrible things. Political hatred, violence, death, and destruction. But Jesus calls us to something more. So today as we worship, today as we mourn death and we see destruction, let us look to Jesus, our true king, our true ruler amidst this world. Amen? Amen. Please stand as you are able as we begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. 
Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have given our from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. No one can come to Things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all holy counsels, and all our service. Give to us our sisters, and that we should the world and our good, and our hearts be sad for the way of the young men. And also that we be defended from the fear of our enemies, and liberally receive the point of us through Jesus Christ. from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by, pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise again the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from the land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people, Israel, the word of the Lord. We'll read now responsibly from Psalm 85. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. That your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall abound The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him 
who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. According to Mark, chapter 6. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to arrest John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod, Herod had mer married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he had heard about him, or when he had heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, as she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid him in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Like I said, quite the uh, gospel text for the events of this last week, right? It's uh, strange, but not so strange. I said before that history might not necessarily repeat, but it definitely rhymes. And this is the story of humanity. This is the story of rulers and kings. There's a HBO show called The Game of Thrones. Anybody else depressed by that show? It was the, one of the biggest letdowns in TV history. They destroyed and butchered that end. And it's a terrible show for a lot of reasons, but the ending was just too, too bad. But humanity, kingship, what does it mean? To be a king is to be a ruler, the highest authority over a people or a nation, right? Kings are powerful. They could do whatever they please, as far as anybody else understands. They command armies and nations. They command life and death. And so, in fact, so much so that kings often called themselves God kings. Throughout the human history, this has been a constant motif and a constant theme. Who was Pharaoh? A God king. Who was the king of 
uh, of the nations in the, the uh, Arab, uh, Arabic Peninsula. God kings. Who's Caesar? God king. Over and over, people aspire to power. They worship it. They seek after it no matter what is in their way and who's in their way. And at what cost? War, pestilence, death and destruction, the travesties of the sacrifice of children and people for political gain. History might not repeat in direct ways, but we see this rhyme in every human kingship, in every human leader, whether they're called king, president, whatever, these patterns always show back up, and people constantly fall into the same traps their ancestors fell into. In the story of Israel, they had a king that arose in a particular time frame, this is the stories that we see in First and Second Samuel, where the people of Israel have had judges who have ruled over them. They've not always been exemplars in moral character, but they are strong figures. They're leaders of the people, and the judges are both men and women. But they're powerful leaders, and they are trusted by the people of Israel to be faithful and to guide them into the future. But Israel eventually starts to look at its neighbors. And just their neighbors all have kings, all have people who are the pinnacles of authority and power and glory, who hold all the wealth, who hold all the land, and they would like to kind of look like that. They want to centralize their power and have it in the hands of one good leader. The first leader is Saul. Saul is a man who's described as being heads above everybody else, and who doesn't love a tall leader, right? I'd be kind of thrown out of the running, not too tall. But he's handsome, and he's a leader of men. He's a natural choice. Saul calls him and sends him and says, you will be the king of Israel, or not Saul, uh, Samuel calls him and sends him out to be the leader of the people of Israel and the king. He anoints him by the gift of God. And he does well, except for the first human trap, pride. The desire to turn yourself into the highest authority. You see, the rules for the people of Israel's king was that he would be a king, yes, but not a king like the other nations. This king would be accountable to God. This king would not, unlike the rest of the world, he would not have more than one wife. He was to be a husband with one wife. And in fact, he wasn't supposed to centralize wealth in himself. And he wasn't supposed to even have two horses. Because what do kings like to do? Have all the best stuff. Our modern day, we want all the Maseratis out in front, right? But the king of Israel wasn't supposed to have even two horses. But Saul, like any worldly king, starts out okay. And then's like, you know, I like having stuff. And who's going to stop me? I'm the king. Pattern? Pattern begins here. Eventually, he's replaced because he loses God's favor, but he's replaced by David. Now, David is a good man by all accounts, but he's also a human. And what does David do? When David has power and authority and control, one day he's, on, he's uh, looking out from his balcony, and on a nearby roof, he sees a woman bathing. We know where that story goes. Because history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it rhymes. And guys, history rhymes, right? We know where that story leads. But not only does David fall into the sin of lust and adultery, but he then falls into the sin of conspiring to have a man murdered in order to cover up his crimes and his sins. Another rhyme in human history and human kingship that pattern consistently happens. 
Now, in the case of David, he eventually is called out by the prophet Nathan. Nathan challenges him, and David repents. He changes, and he swears to God that he will live righteously from that point on. That's what I think makes him actually a good king. The recognition of failure, the recognition that we're not sufficient in our own, that we're not above the law of God, but instead are fully beholden to it and willing to submit our lives to that. But that's not who we're talking about in our scripture text today. Sorry for the long history lesson, but we've got to know these things. It's important to know the context of the Bible. So the figure that we have here is Herod Antipas. Now, Herod the Great, his father, was the single ruler of the area. But when he died, he left his kingdom to four people, to three of his sons and his sister. Now, for our important understanding, the two main sons were Herod Antipas and Herod Archerelius. Herod Archerelius is uh, one of the other sons that was fairly prominent, not as loved. Apparently, what happened just before the death of Herod the Great was that he changed his will. It was originally all going to go to Herod Antipas. He changed that. Herod Antipas and, uh, and Herod Archerelius go to Rome to challenge that in the empire. And Caesar Augustus says, now nah, we're going with the new will. Sorry, head back home. Interestingly, a lot of the people who traveled with Archerelius didn't They actually went there because they didn't want him to be king. (laughs) They wanted to make sure that didn't happen. But when they return, they break up into what is called the Tetrarch. So four rulers over the area of Israel. For our story, Herod Antipas, who I'll try to just call Herod from this point on, he rules Galilee and Parisia. So that's his domain. Galilee is the area where Jesus is preaching and teaching and where his ministry starts. So he's the king of the area. He has everything he wants, besides the whole kingship of of Israel. But he has wealth, power, authority. The only other lord above him are the lords of Rome, Caesar Augustus. You think he might be satisfied at this point? Anybody here say, if I just had a little more power, a little more money, a little more of the things of the world, that I'd be okay? In tax season, I think that. (laughs) Anybody else? But no, it's not enough. Never enough. Because it's never enough for the human heart. So Herod goes off eventually to Rome, and while he's in Rome, he and his brother are boarding together. Sounds really nice. Except while they're boarding together in Rome, Herod meets Herodias, his brother's wife, and they fall in love. And they divorce their wives. Herodias divorces her husband, and Herod divorces his wife, who is also the daughter of the king of Arabia at the time. And you can imagine the political strife that that caused. That's the context of the gospel text today, because John was preaching to Herod, to his face, you have sinned. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You have caused issue within your nation and your people, and you've not followed the law of God, the law of our people. And I love that the text is very specific about this. Herod would listen to him, and he was confused, but he liked to listen to him anyway. So he didn't kill John. He did have him imprisoned on the request of his wife, who did not like the fact that her sins were being aired to the public. And there was a conspiring attempt to kill him. It never happened until Herod fell to his lust once more. I would imagine it's his lust. I've never seen a dance really good enough to make me want to give a man's head for it. Anybody else? So I imagine it's lust. I imagine there's some deeper sin in the midst of this that's going on. But here's the thing. I've mentioned that kings have everything that we worldly seek after. 
Everything that we aim our lives towards, right? That's why they're kings. That's the pinnacle of what it means to be a man or a queen if you're a woman. But is it ever enough? Is stuff enough? Is power enough? Is money enough? And if so, why does every king fall to the desire for more money and more power? Why do they always fall short? Maybe it's because that gaping void in our souls that we seek to fill with material can't be filled with material. Maybe it's because we're called to something more. Maybe it's because God is the only thing that is truly capable of fulfilling our lives and giving us meaning and purpose and value that lasts. Because money goes, power fails, our bodies break down. But God remains the same. And God constantly seeks out righteousness. Now I wanna juxtapose the kingship of the world and what we see over and over, and what we see in the person of Christ. He's not overly mentioned in the text that we're here, we have today. The reason that Herod sees or learns about Jesus' ministry is because the disciples are out preaching his name. They're doing works in his name, and they're acting as emissaries. And there's questions about who he is. He's clearly a man of power. Is it John come back? Is it Elijah, the prophet of prophets of the Old Testament? Is it just a prophet of old? Come again. Over and over, people know that something about Jesus is godly and good. They might not be able to put their fingers on it yet, but they recognize something. Now, as Christians today, or as people who are seeking Christianity, or people who are chasing after Jesus, we recognize and know that he's more than just a prophet. We know that he's not Elijah, and we know that he is not John. Because this man, who did not have money, who did not have armies, who did not have power or authority in the traditional human sense, who started out poor in Nazareth, is the Son of God and the King of kings become human. Not a man pretending to be a God, but a God coming in to be a man. And when he comes into this world, he overturns every understanding that people have had. He overturns the world. How many of you, how many of you knew Herod and his family history before today? That's a king, right? That's somebody that maybe history books are written about. How many of you know about a poor man named Jesus of Nazareth? And you've known about him well before today. And you've heard that name in culture and in the world. Which is stronger? Which is greater? Who is more worthy? And who is the king that took over everything? not through military might, but through love and grace and through not the sacrifice of other people's children for power, but through a sacrifice of himself so that you could become the sons and daughters of God. Everybody serves something. Everybody is a slave to something. Herod, the kings of this world, Slaves to their passions, slaves to their desires, slaves to stuff. Jesus, the servant of God, free and whole, who comes down to our world, not to be served, but to serve, to embrace and to love to be a shepherd and a guide, to know you, to look you in the face when you face your own sins and your own darkness, 
and to say, child of God, I love you and you are mine. Which king will you follow? The kings of this world? The stuff? Or the true king? We have to choose. Because if Jesus Christ is Lord, if Jesus Christ is king, then we don't just say it, we live it. We orient every part of ourselves to that. I believe Christ is king. When I see this world and I see its brokenness, I don't want to worship that. I want to worship the one who solves the sickness, the pain, the loss, and the brokenness. I want to serve the one who serves every lost child, brings us all home. So who is your king? Jesus is mine. Amen.
With the whole church, let us profess our faith. I believe you. was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. One in the communion of saints, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. You gather your people into the body of Christ, where your church is wounded, heal it, where it is right, strengthen it where it is divided, reunite it. We especially thank you for the ministry of Jackie Kuba, who has been our supply organist the past few weeks. Keep her in safety and in the wholeness of your love until she is next among us. We pray also for the work of our Christian education ministry as they offer vacation Bible school this week. Prosper their handiwork in your mercy. From before the foundation of the world, you are God. Revive ecosystems destroyed by human greed. Curb our desire to put wealth ahead of the health of all who call this planet home. In your mercy. You establish equity and make justice. With every nation, tribe, and land, cause laws to be written and customs to be observed that protect the most vulnerable. We pray especially for peaceful and just resolutions to the conflicts in Ukraine, Russia, Gaza, Israel, and Sudan. In your mercy. On the cross, your beloved son endured pain and death. Bring healing to those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. We pray especially for Shannon, Bev, Sandy, Carl, Dennis, and James. In your mercy. You send your spirit into this community of faith. Empower our ministries that serve and build up local communities, particularly Plant a Row, Yarn Works, and our social ministry committee. Nurture our partnerships with other community organizations especially the Nazareth Area Food Bank and the Nazareth Summer Lunch Program. In your mercy. We look to you for saving help again, O God. Be with those we name now, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. In your mercy. All peoples praise you, O God. We give you thanks and praise for the lives of our loved ones who now rest in you. In the fullness of time, gather us with all your saints in light. In your mercy. Our nation is in shock, Lord. Political violence and fomenting hatred run rampant in our world, in the hearts of our neighbors, and in our lives. We pray today for former President Trump, the spectator who was killed, and their family, and the two spectators who were hurt, as well as every person there who was traumatized by the violence and the hatred that was spread among us. Turn us again to you, Lord. Call us to mercy, justice, healing, and righteousness. We also pray for the individual who did terrible things that day, that young man who for some reason let hate rule his life and chose death over mercy. 
We place all of this, Lord, into your hands, knowing that we are insufficient and our words will never be enough. But may your spirit intercede with us with sighs too deep for what we say, for what we know, and for what we feel. Holy God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our King. Amen. At this point, I'd like the congregation to please be seated as I ask all of those who will be helping out in VBS to come forward for the installation. All right. Thank you guys for coming up. And thank you for what you're going to be working on for the next week. <laughs> As we begin this week of VBS, we will be working to grow and to inspire young Christians. Those, some of them who are here, <laughs> from those of our congregation, from those who are not of our congregation but will be here in our church so that they can know the love of God, Hear the word preached them. Enjoy music, crafts, art, good snacks, and just have a good time. We give thanks to God for all of this ministry, for all of the work that you guys will be putting into, all of the effort, the hardships, the behind-the-scenes work, the laughter, and the joy that you will share. Thank you for participating in this ministry and helping us to love and to serve, to care for the youngest of our church. And so let us pray. Heavenly Lord, be with our staff as they put on Scuba Vacation Bible School this year. Keep them healthy in body and mind during and after VBS. Allow opportunities to share the good news of who you are with kids. Give them creative ideas to reach children. Give them peace when times get stressful and fill their hearts with joy as they faithfully complete their work. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And people of God, after this service, this group of people will need your help as you are able because we will be decorating the rest of the church and getting everything finalized for today. So, as these individuals go back to their seats, please remember you are also a part of VBS in the work, in the help, and by giving us the funds and the space to do this. So thank you all for all that you do. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us share that peace. Peace with you. Peace with you, Jackie.
Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. living and loving God. We praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people Israel from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your Son to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who living among us healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. And so we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood, given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life, that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Christ is shed for you. Amen. And the blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen.
Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another for the sake of Christ Jesus, 
our Lord. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.